God, we, we just thank you when you when you just give us opportunities to, to, to feel your heart, God. This is your prayer for us, God. When we say, give me you, when we say everything else can wait, that is what you're asking us, God. What you're saying today is that you want all of us and it grieves your heart when we're only giving you fractions of ourselves. When we're selecting and choosing what we want you to see, God, and you're saying, I want all, I want everything. So God, allow us. God, help me to get through this one. Allow us to to give up everything. What does it profit a man to gain this world and lose his soul? So God, we thank you that all of us today, we say yes. We surrender all to you, God. Everything, God. We give it over to you, God. We say yes to your will and yes to your way, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. Praise God. We thank you all for, for your, your word today. Amen. I'm just so grateful. This, these songs that were sung today for me, and I can only speak for myself, these were not just songs. These, this, is, this is my testimony, and this is where I am in my walk with God as a pastor, as a leader, as a servant. God is saying to me, I want more of you, Rod. Yes, you're walking in my will, and yes, you're doing what I've asked you to do, but in this season, and if you want to go to another dimension, I need more. I need more of your time. I need more of your day. And so today, we're going to be talking about what it looks like when we give all of ourselves to God. The title of our sermon today is Follow Me. Follow me, a loaded request. Follow me, a loaded request. Thanks to you all that are here. Good morning. I promise before the sermon is over, I'll smile and I'll try to make you laugh and we'll have some fun today. But we do have an exciting word that God has placed in our heart. It's going to be found today in Luke chapter 9. If you have it in your Bibles, please turn with me. Luke chapter 9, I want to read verses 18 through 25, and also want to read in the book of Mark as well, Mark chapter number 8, verses 27 through 36. Um, this particular conversation that Jesus is having with his closest followers, his disciples, can be found in your synoptic gospels, which is Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And so we want to make sure that we can gather all the data for this conversation so we can put it all into context. And so um, Luke chapter 9, verse number 18, let's read this in the New King James Version. And it reads, and it happened as he, Jesus, was alone praying that his disciples joined him. And he asked them, saying, who do crowds say that I am? They answered and said, John the Baptist, and some say Elijah, and others say that one of the old prophets has risen again. He said to him, but who do you say I am? Peter answered and said, the Christ of God. And Jesus strictly warned and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Then Jesus said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily, one church ATL, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and in, is himself destroyed or lost? Now let's look at the book of Mark. So this is the account of Luke. As you know, Luke was a physician. Mark's also depicting his perspective through the eyes of Peter. 
A lot of what Mark wrote was Peter's eyewitness testimony to his interactions with Jesus. So there's some things here that, that, that Luke doesn't actually give us that Mark does that's important for this conversation we're having today. Same scenario, we're talking about following Jesus. Picking up that same question that Jesus asked, we'll pick up that 27 verse. It says, now Jesus and his disciples went out to the towns of Caesarea Philippi, and on the road he asked his disciples, saying to them, who do men say I am? So they answered, same, same scenario, John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say I am? Peter answered and said to him, you are the Christ. Then he strictly warned them that they should tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things. You can see how the stories are coinciding together. And be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He spoke this word openly. Now here's something different that, that Mark notes that Luke didn't. He says, then Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. But when he turned around and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. When he had called the people to himself with his, with his disciples also, he said to them, Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's sake will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? We're going to be using the word follow today. That word, when you hear that word follow, just always perk up your ears and listen. Because we're talking about following Jesus today. And anytime I use the word follow, I want you to just pay attention. Because what we're going to learn today is that there are casual followers and they're true followers of Christ. We have to distinguish the two. And I have to give you some backstory in this particular question and conversation that Jesus is having with his closest followers. He's wanting to have an important conversation with his followers. By now, by the time we get to Luke chapter 9, these disciples, these that have been following him, have seen a lot. They've seen Jesus heal. They saw Jesus heal Jairus' daughter, the rule of the synagogue. They saw Jesus when the centurion soldier come to him and said, heal my servant. They saw Jesus do that. They saw Jesus raise a widow's son. They saw Jesus pull out demons out of those that were demon-possessed. They saw him raise people from the dead. They saw him teach. They saw him heal. They saw Jesus' hand. And now by the time we get to this chapter, at the beginning of the chapter, it says, Jesus calls his 12 together. He grants them, go turn to Luke chapter 9, chapter 1. He grants them authority over the enemy. Because we have to put this all into context to understand why he's having this conversation with his disciples. He gives them authority and he sends them out to do exactly what he did. He sends them out to preach, to heal, and to teach the gospel. He sends them out. He's, they've been working with him. They've been discipling. He's been discipling them. And now he says, you got to do what I did. He sends them out. They come back. If you continue to read Luke chapter 9, they come back and they land in this deserted city called Bethsaida. Just keep following me. And here in this city, the crowds are following Jesus. They're following Jesus. They follow him to this city called Bethsaida. It's a deserted city, and Jesus is preaching. The scripture says there's about 5,000 men there. Doesn't tell us how many women and children are there. Jesus is preaching, healing, healing, doing what he does. It's getting late. The disciple says, look, we may need to send these people home, Jesus. We're in this deserted land. There's no nearby Popeyes or Chick-fil-A. So let's let these people go home so that they can feed their families. And Jesus says, no such thing. We're not sending them home. We're going to feed them. The disciple says, wait a minute, Jesus, we only have, you all remember the story, five loaves of bread and two fish. Jesus says, we're going to make it make sense. So he did exactly what he did in communion. He broke it, he blessed it, and he gave it to the disciples. You all, you just remember that? 
in the communion. He blessed it. He broke it. Anytime you see Jesus blessing, breaking, and giving it back, expect multiplication. Same thing with these 5,000 men and the women and children. He blesses it, he breaks it, and he gives it to them. And it multiplies. Jesus wants us to know the formula for multiplication is when we're allowed to be broken, we give ourselves back to the people broken. Then we can have multiplication. He multiplies, he feeds the multitude. They said there's 12 baskets of overflow. Now, Luke and Mark tells us about this feeding of the 5,000, but they leave out something that John gives us. Now, John doesn't record this conversation, but he does record the ending of this meal and this meal prep and this miracle. Watch this in John chapter 14. I need you all to get this. It says that this man... The men said that it was, this man is truly the prophet who's come into the world. Watch this in John chapter 15. Therefore, Jesus perceived they're about to come and take him by force to make him a king. So he departed. The people, the crowds that have been following him, want to make him a king. Jesus knows this is not the type of kingdom that he's come to create on earth. Matter of fact, the first mission statement that Jesus gave us is repent for this kingdom is at hand. It's not your kingdom. This is going to be different. And these crowds of men, they're trying for political reasons, for personal gain and wrong motives, they're trying to crown Jesus as king of the earth. These crowds of people are following Jesus. Who are the crowds? The crowds are the multitude. Let's, let's, let's define the crowds. We're not going to put this on the screen, but we need to know who these people were. These were people who followed Jesus. But here's the thing. They only followed Jesus until he went home. When Jesus went home, they went home. It's kind of like our church service today. We come here, we gather in crowds, and then we go home. You all see the similarity? He, he, as long as, 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 long as he, we come together, as long as there's something for Jesus to give us, we come together, we gather, we meet, then we go home. Monday through Saturday, we live our lives, and as long as there's another gathering, we come back together and we do it all over again. That's what the crowds did. They were there for Jesus' hand. Let me tell you how I know that. Because when Jesus began to suffer, when he began to be ridiculed, when they, when they began to chastise him, the crowds dispersed. By the time we get to Luke chap, or Acts chapter 2, and Jesus has been, been humiliated and humbled, those thousands of people that used to follow him is only down to 150. So that lets me know that these crowds weren't there to really serve him. These crowds were there for what they could get. They were there for the stuff. The crowds was the church. These people, they loved him. He healed them. They came every Sunday. They brought their prayer, prayer requests. God, heal my daughter. Heal my family. Restore my marriage. But then when Jesus left, they left. And there was only a few followers that were willing to go up to the mountaintop with Jesus. So we got fans and we got followers. You all see the difference? We got fans of Jesus and we got followers of Jesus that's willing to, to, to follow him Monday through Saturday, that's willing to go up to the mountaintop and pray. Everybody else that just came there and congregated like we're doing today, they were just there for what they could get. They really weren't there to suffer with Jesus. They really weren't there to say, give me you. Everything else could wait because everything waited until the next time they congregated. And then that's when they picked Jesus back up and they worship him again. But Monday through Saturday, Jesus could wait so they could do their stuff. And that's who the crowd was. The crowd was the church. So Jesus asked the disciples because he's wanting to have this conversation because remember, they're wanting to crown him. And Jesus is just sending his disciples out. 
and he needs to teach his disciples what this is going to be all about. Because he doesn't want his disciples to go out and, the, and when the people start wanting to make them a king. Because sometimes we can hear and begin to hear all the praise. And here, see, Pastor and I, we, we are very careful about saying thank you when you all say we did a great job. Because we know we can't let that stuff get to our head. And Jesus is wanting to make sure as he's sending his disciples out that they don't get caught up in someone wanting to prematurely crown them something that's not within his purpose. So Jesus asks those followers, he says, who, or he asks his disciples, who do the crowd say I am? Who do my fans say I am? Who do those that don't really have a relation with with me say I am. There's no way they can get this right because they don't really have a relationship with Christ. There's no way you can know who he is if you're not walking with him. So he says, oh, I, so the disciple says, oh, I think you, you John, John, they say you're John the Baptist. John the Baptist was a great teacher. Then it says, some says you're Elijah. Elijah in 2 Kings 2, remember he rose up in the chariot Never died. And I think uh, Micah had prophesied that Elijah would return in Micah 4 and 5. So maybe he's Elijah. Maybe he's one of the prophets. When you don't have close relationship with Christ, you won't know who he is. No way for them to really know. This crowd, this church was confused then. <laughs> Guess what? This crowd, this church today is confused. We don't know who he is. We don't know why he came. We don't know what he requires of us. Now, get that out of the way. They don't get it right. So there's three. You can start taking notes now because there's three burning questions. We're going to put this on the screen. Three burning questions that Jesus answers. This is how you know if you're truly following Jesus. This is how we can distinguish between a casual follower and a true follower. Number one, do we know who he is? Number two, do we know why he came? Number three, do we really know what he requires of us? This is where we rubber meets the rose. The first question he asks his disciples is, do you know, you that walk with me, do you know who I am? And guess what? I'm going to give Peter partial credit because he says, you are the Christ. In other words, you are the Messiah. The Hebrew word is Messiah. You are, the, you are the anointed one. You are the chosen one. You are the one that the prophets prophesied would liberate the children of Israel from bondage. You are our king. You are our redeemer. They understood that Jesus would, would redeem them, but they didn't understand the kingdom. They thought because the Jews were under Roman occupation that he was going to come and physically set up a camp and, re, and, and relinquish them from bondage. So they I'm giving Peter partial credit for this answer because he, in fact, is right. Jesus is our Messiah. He's our Savior. He's our Lord. He's our Redeemer. He's our Liberator. And so we give him credit for that. These guys got more of the answers right because they had been walking with Jesus. They understood who he was because they had a close relationship with Jesus. When Jesus went home, they went home with him. Jesus, you're not, you're more than a teacher. Jesus, you're more than a prophet. You are my Messiah. You are my Savior. You are my Lord. You are my Redeemer. A plus for the disciples, for those of them that walked near him, they get they got that part right. But the second question, and my next slide says, but why did Jesus come? It's three questions we're trying to answer. Who he is? Or who is he? Number two, why did he come? And this is where even those that walked the closest with him didn't understand why he came. The prophets had prophesied. 
Daniel, Hosea, Zechariah, Jeremiah. They had prophesied that the Redeemer or the King would come, but the, even those that walked closely with Jesus didn't understand why he came because their definition of a kingdom had nothing to do with suffering. They didn't really pay attention to Isaiah and Isaiah 53 when he said Jesus would be what? He would be despised. Jesus would be rejected. And they missed that. They had this idea of this kingdom and this royalty, and they never associated and correlated pain and suffering. It, victory was the kingdom. It didn't look like suffering. If I'm suffering, that doesn't look like the vision I have of my king. And so they miss this part of who Jesus is. So here's the definition, the son of man. This is the definition of why he came. We know who he was, who he is. He's the Messiah. He's the chosen one. But why did he come? And I want you to write this down, and this is going to resonate with you. And hopefully we leave here today with a different revelation. Because this is the reason that Jesus came. And he explains it to the disciples. The Son of Man came to suffer many things, to be killed, and after three days rise again so that mankind can be redeemed from our sins. That's not rocket science to you, but that is why he came. Now, let me help you all out today. Our salvation package includes other things. Yes, Jesus is Jehovah Rapha. He is the God that heals us. He is our provider. We can pray to him for our families and our marriages. He can help us to get increases on our job. He can heal our body. He can do all these things. But the reason that Jesus came, according to the covenant, was to suffer many things, be killed, be raised from the dead so that we can be redeemed from our sins. That's it. That is why Jesus left the throne and came here to earth, was to suffer, was to be rejected, was to be, was to be humiliated and die and raise himself from the grave through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit so that we can be saved. So here's my question to you, and it's a burning one, but we ain't going to put it on the screen. If that's all that Jesus did for you, if, and if that's all he did for you, would you still serve him? Because that's the reason that he came, to suffer things, to die, and raise himself from the grave so that we could be redeemed. That is why he came. That is the very essence of our salvation. And if that's all he did for you, would you still follow him? Remember those fans, those casual followers, they were following him for the other stuff because they didn't know what he, who he was and why he came. They weren't following him for salvation. They were following him for the other stuff. If, the only, if you only knew that he was going to save your soul and nothing else, would you still follow him? Or do we need the stuff attached to it? Or are we following him for the stuff? Do we want a savior, as another pastor put it? Do we want a savior or do we want a sugar daddy? So now... The disciples are learning not only who he is, but why he came. And this is different because what they're going to realize is that if my Savior and my Lord suffered, guess what? Thank you. That means I got to suffer too. That wasn't in the package. That wasn't in my contract to suffer. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. <laughs> so Jesus says, I came here to suffer. Now watch this. That's why I wanted to read Mark, because, because Mark lets us in on, G, on Peter's perspective. Peter says, hey, Jesus, come, come, here, come, here, come here, homie. Come over to the side. Let's talk, man. You're talking about suffering and you're talking about being rejected. Let me, let me holler at you over in the corner, man. He took him, the scripture says he took him to the side, trying to get away. And then the Bible says he rebuked Jesus. 
That's, the rebuke is a word that Jesus used when he cast out demons. It's a strong chastisement. It's a strong correction. Peter, with conviction, said, you are not going to suffer. You are our king. He didn't know who Jesus was and why he came. The Bible says that Jesus turns to him and in front of everybody, because, see, Jesus is asking questions. Who do the crowd say I am? Who do you say I am? And you know anytime heaven is asking earth question, heaven already knows the answer. Anytime God is asking us something, you better believe it's a teachable moment because he already knows the answer to the question. He's trying to teach these boys something. He says, wait a minute. Peter pulls him to the side privately, and then Jesus openly says, I rebuke you. What does he say? Get thee behind me, Satan. Because you don't know who I am, you don't know why I came. And if I, if I, if I just come, succumb to your vision, one church ATL can never be saved. Because your vision of who I am doesn't involve me suffering. If I don't suffer and die, you can't live. So get thee behind me, Satan. You don't know who I am. You don't know why I came. Let me ask you scholars. We got some scholars in the room. Help out some of those other people. Where was the last time we heard Jesus say, get thee behind me, Satan? Somebody talk out loud and tell me. Were we here on the mountain or in the wilderness? We heard Jesus use those words before. He used those exact same words when he was talking to Satan in Luke chapter 4 in the wilderness. He was hungry. Satan thought he was weak. You all remember Satan says, if you be the son of God, turn these stones into bread. If you be the son of God, Jump down off this cliff because the angels will catch you and, 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 and you won't even, your feet won't even touch the stone. If you want all this kingdom, forfeit the suffering and just worship me. What was Satan doing in that moment where Jesus had to say to him what he said to Peter? When he said, get thee behind me, Satan, he was doing the same thing that Jesus did. He was questioning who he was and why he came. If you be the son of God. This kingdom, you can have this kingdom forfeit of you suffering. You don't get the kingly glory without the suffering or the cross. Jesus is rebuking Peter for the same reason he rebuked Satan. He's questioning who he is and why he came. Peter is rejecting the word of God. And Jesus says to him, when you reject my word, come on now, you got to just hear this. When we believers reject God's word, we now play into the hands of the enemy. We're now, we're now a spokesperson for the enemy. When we reject God's word and his purpose, because Peter is now speaking against Jesus' purpose. If Jesus doesn't suffer, if there's no shedding of blood, and, and Satan is saying, you don't have to shed blood. Let me show you a shortcut here to take. I'll give you this kingdom, which is not the kingdom that Jesus was there to redeem. I'll give you this kingdom. Just worship me. He says, no, I'm not here for that kingdom. For this kingdom that I've come to redeem you of, there requires a shedding of blood. There requires a suffering. There requires me to deny myself. At some point in my life, I'm going to say, I want this cup to pass for me, but nevertheless, your will be done, God. If we want what God has given us, we have to say what he said, not my will, your will. Those psalmists were seeing today that the blessings were coming after me. I was listening to you all today. God was speaking to us today. God has given us his blessings. The blessings have overtaken us. Now Jesus says, the blessings have come after you. Now he says, I need you to come after me. You all see that in the scripture? He says, if you want to come after me. So now we understand the requirements for salvation. Two things, knowing who Jesus is and knowing why he came. If you accept who he is and why he came, guess what? You're saved. Raise your hand. We're all saved. Look at that unanimous, everybody saved in the house. If you're not saved, we're going to do an altar call. Come up here, Pastor. There were some people that didn't raise their hands. So if you're not saved, raise your hands. We're going to do an altar call right now. If you're not saved, you, you need to be saved. We can't do this if you're not saved. 
he just got happy. Alabama won. Yes, let me, let me plug Alabama right here. Alabama won. He's happy. He's saved. God is good. We got a thumbs down back there, but all is well in the kingdom of Alabama. Let's get back to this kingdom of God, though, because what was I? What was I? That 50-year-old thing hit me. Jesus said that. Wait a minute. What was we talking about? Oh, I know why. No, I wasn't talking about road tie. I wasn't talking about road tie. I was talking about the requirements for salvation. We all agree that we're saved because we all know who Jesus is. He's our Messiah. He's our Savior. And we've confessed and accepted and professed that he died, that he was raised from the grave. We are saved. Congratulations. That costs us nothing. Two of the three cost you nothing. To know who he is and to know why he came costs you nothing. But let's take a look at number three because this is going to cost us everything. This separates us from the casual follower of Christ. This separates us from the crowd. If you're not willing to do number three, that means that you're just a casual follower of Christ. Number three, what does he require of us? Jesus did his part. Now it's our turn. What does this require of us? Buckle up. This is when this message gets a little bit more challenging. So just smile at me if you don't like me, if you don't like what I say. At least just smile back and just fake it. But here's the first thing that Jesus said. He says, if you want to come after me, the psalmist today told us that the blessings have come after us. Now Jesus says, if you want to come after me, let me give you the formula. And number one, you must deny yourself. Or in other words, I, Roderick Green, must deny myself. We got to understand what Jesus meant when he said deny myself. So let's look at the, the natural definition of deny. To refuse to give or to grant something requested or desired. You reject it. Say, no, I'm not going to do that. And the thing about denial or self-denial is that it could be something that, you know, like last week I was trying or attempting to deny myself of some sweets. I love sweets. I'm a sweet junkie. So I know that the sweets are increasing my A1C. And so I want to deny myself or have self-denial of things that are not good for me for a good purpose. So it's a great thing when we can have self-denial. But there's a difference between self-denial and denying myself. So let's look at what Jesus is saying when he says to deny myself. Denying self is a rejection or when we reject to separate myself from anything within that is opposed to the will of God. This is when we surrender ourselves to Christ and determine that we are going to obey his will. He says deny ourselves daily, which constitutes perpetual, consistent rejection and separation of anything within that opposes the will of God. And that's different from self-denial. Self-denial is for me. And my purpose, denying myself, is for Christ and his purpose. When I go on a diet because I want to lose weight, that's self-denial. It's for a good purpose, but that's for me. But when I fast, that is denying myself because now I'm interested in the will of God and I'm interested in, the, in God's purpose for my life. Do you all understand the difference between self-denial and denying myself? Jesus is saying, I need you to deny yourself. I need you to reject and separate yourself from anything within that opposes God's will. Now look at this scripture in Galatians 2 and 20. Because this is what Paul demonstrated in the scripture, what denying ourselves looks like. He says, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I have now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. 
this is what denying myself looks like. It is no longer I that lives within, but it's Christ. There's a separation of my flesh. Remember when Peter denied Jesus? Peter was separating himself from Jesus. They said, Peter, weren't you with Jesus? Peter says, I do not know that man. When we deny ourselves, we're saying, I do not know this fleshly, Romans 7, wretched, fleshly man. I am separating myself from who I am and allowing the Holy Spirit to come and live within me and to make himself at home. Denying myself means that I allow the Holy Spirit to reside, to be at home. And, and so we have to ask ourselves this question. Is the Holy Spirit, does he feel at home within our bodies? Welcome into this place. Welcome into this. We sing these songs. We say, I invite you in, Holy Spirit. But does he really feel at home? How many Sanford and Son junkies do we have in here? Sanford and Sons, some of you younger may not remember. There was an episode of Sanford and Son. You all remember there was an episode with Lamont. Um, you know, he was always out looking for stuff, trying to make a little dollar. He bought the little porcelain toilets that time. They were the, the little fake copper. And he just was always trying to get a deal. He went out and found this piano. You all remember the piano episode? This guy says, I'll give you this piano if you just move it out of my house. None of you all remember that episode? We got a few that remember that. So, so Lamont goes back and gets his old dad played by Red Fox, he comes back with his dad. They're going to move this piano, and that God's going to give it to him. He says, I just need it out. So the guy comes into this elaborate home. The guy says to Fred and Lamont, he says, make yourselves at home. You all remember this episode. And the minute uh, Fred walks over on this, he's getting ready to walk over toward the piano. It's on some, this carpet. The guy from the back screams, uh, uh, uh. He's like, don't put your foot, that Italian carpet was, was given to me by my great-grandfather, and you're not allowed to touch that. He went and got them the shoes. Remember, he went and got them the shoes and made them wear these shoes that they weren't comfortable in? But at the same time, he's saying, uh-uh-uh, but make yourself at home. He goes and gets the phone call. He goes in the back. Fred's getting ready to sit down his, in this chair. She remembers it. This man says again, uh-uh-uh. That chair was given to me by my uncle, that chair, and, and he makes this story about why he couldn't sit in the chair. So then Fred gets up and he goes over and he's getting ready to touch this painting on the wall. The guy from the back's on the phone. He says, uh, 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 don't touch that painting. He told him that he was welcome, that his home was his home. But every time they went to get comfortable in his house, he said, uh, uh, uh. And that's what we do with the Holy Spirit. We say, welcome into my house. Come in and dwell with me. My place is your place. But when he wants to start touching our stuff, uh, uh, uh. You can't touch my job. You can't touch my time, Holy Spirit. You can't touch my plans, Holy Spirit. Get your hands off my money, Holy Spirit. Get your hands off my goals, Holy Spirit. Uh, uh, uh. We say you're welcome. But we really have not denied ourselves. Denying ourselves is a Full denouncement of me. I started to play, bring this episode in. Denying ourselves looks like everything I want to do is almost like doing the opposite of what my flesh wants to do. That's what deny. It's a denouncement of who I am. And so I have a burning statement here today. We'll put it on the screen. What Jesus is saying to us: If you desire me, then deny you. This isn't for the casual follower. You all are beginning to see the difference between the crowds and those that says, I want to go that extra mile with you. The crowds are not going to deny themselves. They're not going to give up their TV time. Baby, are you willing to give up Hallmark, your Hallmark Christmas movies? She shook her head, said no. 
Denying myself means that if God tells me to give up golf, I'll put it on me. I'll put it on me because I'll play a lot of golf. But God is beginning to attack my time and saying, Rod, you said welcome in, but when you're on your way to the driving range, what will you do when I say stay here instead of going hitting balls? You stay here and spend that hour with me and my word and learning about who I am. That's denying myself when I'm separating myself from anything that would oppose God's will. Because if God is bringing me and taking me behind this veil where few just decide to go, I have to be willing to crucify myself just like Jesus did. That's what we have to do. If I desire him, I must deny me. But that's not all us followers of Christ because the second thing that Jesus said after he said deny myself, he says, now I've got to take up a cross. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. This is the message for this hour. And if you don't know Christ, if you're not going to follow Christ, you're not going to know him. Remember pastor last week was talking about knowledge? And you took the word out of knowledge, no. You don't know Christ. If you're not, and there's, I, I, pastor and I was talking about this, but there's some scriptures in the Bible where it says, Abraham knew Sarah. You all remember that? See, I knew Tanya. And, and Kayla was begat. Or, or she, I, we begat Tanya, uh, Kayla, because we knew each other. There was a form of intimacy that creates that multiplication that we're talking about. So at least I've known you at least twice since we've been together. Because there's a form of intimacy that comes. Your father's here too. I shouldn't have said that in front of him. That's your baby girl that I know, that I knew, that I want to continue to get to know. I'm just kidding. Y'all, man, y'all keep. I told y'all we're going to laugh a little bit. We're going to laugh a little bit. I'm, I'm done crying now. The tears are gone now. We're having fun. But when we have intimacy with Christ and we know him, when we truly know him, then we have a desire to go that extra mile with him. But if you don't know him, you're never going to honor his request. He says to take up a cross daily. He said take up his cross because I see people wearing these crosses, and I always wonder if they know what that means. Do you all understand when he says everybody has an individual cross to bear? So here's the definition, to be willing to endure whatever is placed upon us for the sake of God's will. Because Jesus, he bore his cross. His cross, he bore it. And he allowed that burden to be with him wherever, how heavy that cross was, he carried that burden for the sake of God's will. Now Christ is asking us, are you willing to endure whatever is placed upon your shoulders for my will, for my sake? Are you willing? Because sometimes we carry the cross and then we put it down. I, I can't do this, God. God is saying, if you want to come up to me, you're going to have to deny yourself. He's setting us up for some suffering. He's setting us up for some discomfort. He's setting us up to be ridiculed. And we want to be the world's friend, but the world needs us to endure whatever's placed on our back. Because if he doesn't endure that cross, he never gets to be placed on it so he can say, it is finished. If he doesn't endure that thing, that thing that we've been rejecting, Christ is saying, you got to pick it back up. We want to be comfortable and we want this walk to be, be luxurious. And the disciples themselves rebuked him when he started talking about suffering, but he says, you're going to have to be willing to endure it. Put it on your back and carry it. Because he, if he doesn't die, then we can't live. He's got to die. And if he doesn't carry that cross, he doesn't get to be nailed to it. And if he doesn't get to be nailed to it, he doesn't get to die. And if he doesn't get to die, my preach, we don't get to live. So how many of us here have been given our assignment of a cross to bear where somebody else's deliverance is depending on it? 
My bearing the cross and saying, yes, God, I'll, and, and God is calling us to a higher place in him. He's calling us to bear a, a heavier cross, Pastor. And if we don't say yes, how many people are going to suffer? If we don't say yes to this cross, we're not even here today congregating. What is your cross? What does God call you to endure for the betterment of his people and for the purpose that he has for you in your life? Are you willing to carry that cross. The cross was not just this point of reference in biblical history. The point, the cross is the most pivotal point in our human history to where if we don't get the cross, we don't get redemption. Do you all hear that? If Christ doesn't carry that cross, we don't get redemption. If he forfeits the pain, and the, 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 the inconvenience, then we don't get to stand here and say, I thank you for your mercy and I thank you for your grace. He said, you're going to deny yourself, you're going to pick up your cross, and number three, you're going to follow me. Now, you all understand this following me thing a little bit better now? It's not just about this. It's not about the gathering. The crowds did that. They followed Jesus until he started suffering and they were nowhere to be seen. But here's the true definition. And this is why I said follow me is such a loaded proposition. Because this is what entails following Christ. The acceptance of who Jesus is. Start there. And why he came. And. This is our part and an agreement to separate myself from anything that opposes God's will and to endure anything related to God's purpose for my life. That, it, what, that is what it means to follow Jesus. Accept who he is, why he came, be willing to separate myself from anything that opposes his will, and to endure anything for the sake of God's purpose. That first part, that salvation part, cost us nothing. It cost us nothing. This discipleship part to follow Christ is going to cost us everything. Are we willing to pay, as we close, are we willing to pay the price to follow Christ? him not a casual follower not a casual follower when we show up for the stuff the stuff but a true follower of Christ where we're willing to go behind the veil and to have an intimate relationship with him to where we can be used pastor and I have been talking about impact all year Unless we do these things, we won't have an impact. The believers, the, the, the crowd doesn't have an impact on the kingdom. Those that have an impact are those that are truly willing to follow Jesus. You all remember, did you, did you all realize this was the second time Jesus asked them to follow him? Come on, theologians. Uh, nod your head, yes or no. Was this his first request or his second request, asking them to follow him? When did he ask them the first time? When he first met them, when he met Peter, when he met Luke, when he met Matthew, he says, follow me. They followed him because they believed him, but they did not know him. So now he's revisiting this with them and teaching them now what it truly means to follow him. This is his second request. This is our second request, One Church ATL. You're here because you accepted the first invitation. You believed in Jesus, but you didn't know him. And now he's saying to us, us, since we've all gotten a little closer, we've come to the mountaintop, he's saying to us again, now will you follow me? I asked you the first time, you didn't know me. You just said, yeah, but now. Now that you understand that it's going to cost you something, 
Because it's just going to be a few of us that's going to raise our hand for that. And even if we raise our hand, will our actions complement our words? Because I don't even want to ask anybody today who's really going to follow Christ. I don't need to know that. But following Christ means that first and foremost, I'm going to allow God to take everything from me. Give me you. Everything else can wait. Following Christ means I'm putting everything else on hold for the sake of the kingdom. Nevertheless, I know what I want, but your will be done. For those of us that say yes, the second time he's asked us, we are the ones that have an impact on the kingdom. Those disciples says yes, and they just, after he left, they just multiplied the gospel. And the crowds went home. The crowds went home. By the time he had suffered, the crowds had gone home because he wasn't giving out stuff anymore. Now he's asking us. And you know I've asked this question before. Are you interested in being a producer or a consumer? That's what it comes down to. Do we have producers in here or consumers? Only you can answer that question. Stand to your feet. He finished that line of questioning, that teaching moment, by saying to the disciples, what, what does it profit a man? You, 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 you gain the notoriety of this world, whatever it is that we want here, we want to be rich, we want to be famous. I don't know what our own personal aspirations or ambitions here on earth. But he said, what does it matter for you to gain all of that and to lose your soul? I started to bring my rope. Remember I, did, I had the rope one time? We stretched the rope out. There was a little bit of the rope that represented our life here on earth. And the rest of the rope that expanded all over the room was eternity. We're, are we working for just a small amount of time in our existence? Or are we preparing ourselves for the long, eternal time that we're going to have? Only you can answer that question. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. God, just touch our hearts. Touch our souls, touch our minds, God. We are saying, and these are just not words, God, but we are saying that we want you. We are saying, give us you. And God, as we sang that song today, you said to us, don't let those just be words. But that is your heart today. Your, your heart, you are able, you enable me to see your heart. And how much you desire that we said everything else can wait. Lord, give us you. Can we sing some more of that praise team? Because we're now singing that song with an understanding of who he is. With an understanding of why he came. And now with an understanding what he wants from us. Hallelujah.
that's you here today and you do not have a personal relationship with God, can we just describe it as, as knowing him as our Messiah. He's our Savior. And what I love about Jesus is that I didn't have to give up anything. Because a lot of us were just, we were taught to believe that we had to give up things before we came to Christ. What we didn't realize is that Jesus says, I'll take you right where you are. And that's who he is. He's a savior, savior who came to liberate us. He didn't ask us to liberate ourselves. While we were yet sinners, he loved us enough that he would die. So salvation is just believing and receiving it. That he did die, that he rose from the grave and overcome and defeated the enemy. The scripture says we would be saved. If that's you today, I want you to see me right after service. That is important that we all leave here with full confidence in our Messiah, in our Savior. And so, you, you, we don't, if you, if you say, well, I, I, I still got some stuff. No, God says, you know, we all, when we accepted Christ, we still had stuff. God is still working on our stuff. God had me fasting and consecrating this week for some of my stuff. He's still perfecting us as believers. But he, like they say, he loved us enough to pick us up from where we were, and he loves us too much to let us stay there. He intends on completing the work within us. It's not our job. That's his business. So you don't have to do anything but just say yes. If that's you today. We want to see you and we want to just pray with you and just celebrate with you your being into the kingdom of God that brings about life and peace. Amen. Amen. Just pay attention to our announcements. I'll be right back. One God, one church, one mission. We are One Church ATL. Please tune in for our upcoming announcements. Men, mark your calendars for October 4th through the 6th. The One Church ATL Men's Ministry, The Unit, will be hosting the annual men's retreat in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Registration is now open. Introducing the first annual Battle Royale Spades Tournament, hosted by One Church ATL. So September 21st is your time to shine on the table. Who will be the winner? Registration is $20 per player, and all donations will be going to the Community Zone nonprofit organization. Registration ends this Wednesday, September 18th. Mark your calendar for Saturday, September 21st, as we join Must Ministries to fellowship and feed the community as one. We will be meeting at 5 to 7.30. The One Church ATL Praise Team will be hosting auditions starting September 22nd at 12 p.m. in the Piano Room, Room 102. Auditions will be held regularly on fourth Sundays. For more information, please contact Minister Amber Green. Bible Theory Made Simple with your pastors, elders, and ministers of One Church ATL. Join us again on September 25th at 7 o'clock as we dig into God's Word and grow as a unit to sharpen one another. Make sure to have a Bible and notepad ready. The One Love Ministry will be meeting in the sanctuary on September 28th from 6 to 8.30 p.m. Please bring a snack to share with the group. Feel free to invite another couple that are intended to marry and or married. Please be on the lookout for more details. From IRL to URL, stay up to date with all things One Church ATL on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. We love our new guests. Please scan the QR code to fill out a brief questionnaire. Thank you for tuning in to our service at One Church ATL. We look forward to having you join us in person or again during our online presence next Sunday at 10 a.m. Have a great week. Welcome back. Welcome back to our first annual Spades Tournament. We have Larissa and Ty, the Sex Disciples. Give it up. Give it up for being Sex Disciples. And we have now Laura and Michonne. Three hundred.
323 points. And Team Boston Bosses has 325 points. And both teams are going for the win. That's right, you heard me. Both teams went for seven. So let's get to it. The play is on Larissa. Thank you for tuning in to our service at One Church ATL. We look forward to having you join us in person or again during our online presence next Sunday at 10 a.m. Have a great week.